Our next speaker is Beth Mason. Um, Beth works for Saputo Foods across Canada. And Saputo is the largest dairy in Canada and the third largest in the US. Her role was dealing with the distribution of liquid byproducts into livestock feed, which I'm sure we'll learn more about, and other avenues of research. So how did she get to Saputo? Well, they were a customer of hers when she ran her feed business, recycling a million liters of food byproducts each week into liquid livestock feed in the Fraser Valley. Prior to that, she had a hog farm with 250 sows, also in the Fraser Valley. And prior to that, she worked for the BC Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries as a swine specialist. So I first read that as a wine specialist, and I thought, best job ever, <laughs> but as a swine specialist. Still might be a good job, I don't know. <laughs> Some little known facts about Beth. She experiments in her shop at home with areas of interest in yeast fermentation, she says it's not beer, and algae growth. So she is the original crazy mad scientist, and Brad, she's had no explosions so far, but does admit to a bit of leftover smelly fish guts from previous work. <laughs> Beth's topic tonight is, can we feed the world but sustain the planet? Beth. short too so I guess I have to change that. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. Um, so the piled higher and deeper, Danny told me I'm not to offend anybody, um, which I'm sure I can't do. Because I want to look at a global perspective. I think it's wonderful we have all this local produce, but we live in a little bit of an isolated world here whereby we do have access to those things. I operate in a global climate and we need to look at how we'll feed the world in, in 15 years time when we get another 2 billion people. And the question is, can we do that without damage to all the things that agriculture is traditionally criticized for? And I have to get that in there because working in the agriculture industry, I guess for 30 years, I get a little upset at all the criticism we get. And I don't think we'll get any of that here. The first uh, concern in feeding more people is we only have limited land base. So, okay, on Salt Spring you might have an acre and we're very privileged, as I say. But most of the land that's agricultural is in the tropics. So what do you do about people who don't live there? Um, same as in the city versus the country. And all that 9 billion people by 2030 um, requires more food, which requires more resources, which basically is what is ultimately theoretically responsible for climate change. We know that oil <coughs> reserves are diminishing and our demand is gr growing. But here's a picture that I think you need to take home with you, and that is food waste. 30% of what we produce right now is wasted, whether that be in the fields, in transport, um, en route, in storage. And yet, we still have people starving in parts of the world. And we are going to have another 2 billion people to feed. So I want to look at two areas. Uh, agriculture has made incredible advances over the last 50 years. And let's talk about a yield maximum. Like we've increased crop yields, we've increased livestock yields, we've increased welfare through breeding and nutrition. But now what do we do? Where do we go if yields are maximized? Well, first of all, farming is now moving into being a major energy producer as opposed to consumer. So that's the first area I want to look at, is the biofuels. Again, another area that gets negativity because of this concept that food is used for fuel. So we're moving away from that to things like algae. Um, algae farming is now um, a real uh, prospect in the US. We have algae farms in Hawaii. People are used to things like St. Mary's Lake growing algae, and then we can blame all the farmers <laughs> because they polluted it, and that's why the algae grew. But in actual fact, algae are huge uh, producers of proteins and oils. And if you can grow them on CO2 and light, which is their basic requirements, you can do these things too. You can take CO2 from dirty coal plants, grow algae, 
extract the oil, which then supplies our energy, and produce livestock feed. So we're now farming energy. The next one is ethanol. Uh, everybody's heard probably about corn to ethanol and how that's terrible because we're using a food stuff. We now are on second generation ethanol production from things like switchgrass, micanthus, byproducts. This is a second gen uh, ethanol plant based on things like corn stover and straw. So we're no longer driven by corn to ethanol. We're producing byproducts and energy crops into energy to drive our economy. So your cars drive on ethanol. Most of you fill up with ethanol fuel. Uh, closer to on farm, we're producing methane from manure. So the piled higher and deeper qualification I got just obviously enables me to work with poop. Um, I knew it was going to be hard to follow Christine, but you know that's my feeble effort at humour. Those, those are all digesters that we have on farms in, in Wisconsin. We have them in Canada too. We produce methane by fermenting manure. And then the other one is bioplastics. You know, people want renewables and what have you. Anything you can make from petrochemicals, you can make from sugar. And we have phenomenal, phenomenal amounts of food waste, which is a sugar source. So those are three energy areas. The other thing agriculture is doing that I think doesn't always get presented in the right way is health. We've dealt with livestock health. This lady, Temple Grandin, did a lot for animal welfare over the last 50 years. And we've done a lot on food quality. We have one of the best quality systems there is globally for food quality. Um, but that's expanding too. And as we move forward, uh, a lot of those energy crops are created by bugs. And our interest in bugs with DNA sequencing now is enabling us to go forward and look at what we grow, how it affects our bodies, and whether we can make that better. So examples you'll already know are immune modulation with omega-3s. We can feed livestock um, different types of feed to enhance the omega-3 content of the milk or the meat. We can put prebiotics into breads. So we're looking at, you know, not only are we feeding people, but are we feeding them better? Which moves into what's called the human microbiome. Your body contains 10 times the number of bacterial cells as it does human cells. There are 10 trillion bacteria in your body. And we're only just learning what those do. So livestock as well it's, is a growing area for how those bacteria, good or bad, interact with the nutrition that we feed. So we're seeing now a, a lot more movement into alternatives to antibiotics um, through manipulation of the microbiome in the body from nutrition. So my question at the beginning was, how do we feed another 2 billion people? Um, the answer is, we have a yield gap in those tropical areas that we can improve by some of this better use of sustainable resources, recycling of those resources, reduction of food waste, uh, the 30% food waste you saw at the beginning, I see that all the time. That's not a, a fluke. And... Um, as I say, improving that yield gap by better transportation, better storage, better genetics, and genetic manipulation, which everybody doesn't want to hear about, but it's there. So that's what agriculture is 